All right, hello everyone. So I decided to pre-recording, pre-record this uh, review session for exam three and post it early for you all tomorrow. And also I have stimulation tomorrow and it's in the time of tutoring. So I will just go ahead and pre-record this tonight um, so that you guys can study early tomorrow, okay? So, Exam three, last exam before the HESI for medical surgical. It has been a long way that you guys uh, have been through. So just study hard, a few large more push until the end of the semester, okay? So during my semester, exam three was one of the hardest exam um, in the three exam that we took, um, but it is doable and you, if you guys prepared and know the stuff that we talked about during the tutoring session and pay attention in class and do whatever, do everything that you guys have been doing, um, then you guys be fine, okay? It's going to be okay. So just let's go ahead and get started. Trust me, trust Professor Lanasa and trust yourself, all right? So what is important to know? Obviously, I cannot cover everything. I try, this is the hard exam. So this is going to be a little longer than normal tutoring session. And also, obviously I can't cover everything, but these are some of the more important things that I think you guys need to know beside other important things. So definitely know the medication. Please go back and watch my medication review um, so that you can know all of those medication. It just be good for you guys just, just please go back and watch it because even though you guys have a medication quiz I remember during exam three she hit really hard on the medications as well so please go back and learn all of your cardiac medication all of your GI medication pay specific attention to Socrafe and Tassis know when to give them why do we give them what is their mechanism of actions uh, no neuro medications as well uh, mestinon glaucoma medication, no stroke medication, the TPA, what is TPA, thrombolytic, okay? No, it, no the ex inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you guys also have to know the different disease in, of the neuro chapter, no MS, um, MG, ALS, um, ground to brain, GBS disease. So know all of that. Also know the pre and post cataract surgery, pre and post operative of cataract surgery, no about stroke, no right-sided stroke failure, no right side stroke and left side stroke, um, no PAD, peripheral arterial disease and peripheral venous disease, no the important thing about the, of, of the disease, like especially the intermittent qualification. So we're gonna go all of, all, go over all of this and more during this tutor review session. Uh, just bear with me. It's, a, it's late at night, but um, I'm going to get this done um, so that I can review this material for myself and also can help you guys successfully uh, get through the class, okay? You guys got this. All right, first thing first, cardiac chapter. Uh, what factors that affect cardiac output? So please know preload and afterload. Again, preload is anything happens before it gets to the heart. So it's the volume that go into the inferior and superior vena cava, go into the right side of the heart. So anything happens before it gets to the heart is considered preload. So usually issue with preload are too much fluid or too much volume. So how do we fix the preload issues, which is also known as fluid issues? We give them diuretic, so it reduces the volume that that go gonna go through the heart. So often preload is increased because we have too much volume or regurgitation of the valve or heart failure. Regurgitation of the valve meaning that the valve is not closed strong enough uh, that causes backup of fluid into the uh, previous chamber and cause an increase in fluid in that chamber. And also heart failure causes backup of fluid, correct? So that is preload, fluid, okay? Next, we have afterload. Afterload is do going to deal with the resistance that the heart has to pump against in order to get the blood out. So the resistance uh, which left the vent which the left ventricle must pump 
to get the, the, the blood out. It had to deal with the diameter and atherosclerosis. It's like the fat clot that um, causes obstruction in the blood vessel that causes an increase in resistance for the blood in order to get through. Also a narrow vessel, a constriction vessel can also cause us increasing blood pressure, which also causes increased resistance. How do we treat after load issue? We give them vasodilators to increase the diameters of the blood vessel to lower the risk of resistance and lower the blood pressure. A vasodilator will lower the blood pressure and increases pulse because more blood pressure is able to flow. Last is the contractility of the heart. So this is the force of cardiac contraction. Patient with AFib has issue with contractility. AFib heart does not pump effectively. How do we fix it? Getting the heart pump regularly. We give medication like digoxin, cardizem, uh, which is a calcium channel blocker. A heart failure patient also have issue with contractility. So heart muscle is weakening, maybe due to a heart attack or damage then we have to give the toxin to effectively help the heart pump more effective, okay? So in this, I'm not going to, be able to go over med. So you guys have to go back to my medication three, exam three review to look at it, okay? Because there's so much information and I cannot cover med again. So please go back and watch it if you guys have any concern about med because med is going to be big here. So assessment fighting for hurt. So we have to know about blood pressure. Not enough blood pressure causes poor perfusion. Too much blood pressure can cause vascular damage, meaning high blood pressure, too high blood pressure can cause um, vascular damage, stroke, brain bleed, bleeds, tear down organs, and lead to the kidney disorder. Okay, right now I want you guys to pause this video for one moment and then go look for the stages of hypertension. Those are really important to know. You guys have to know the parameters of the blood pressure, different stage, stage one, stage two, stage, stage three, so that you guys are able to, to have the information because I remember I have that question in the exam. So please pause this video and go look up this information, the different stages of high blood hypertension, okay? Next, move on to EKG. EKG enable us to access the conductivity, meaning that the rhythm of the herd, how the herd beats, um, through the, the EKG. Heart sounds, uh, heart sound, whooshing sound, meaning the valve not closed all the way, fluid back up when the valve doesn't close all the ways. Uh, pulses, peripheral pulses, good pulses at blood three mean good tissue perfusion. Not good pulses in the feet will accompany by cyanosis, tingling, bad capillary refill, cold temperature, and these are indication of poor perfusion, all right? Now next, what is hypertension? Hypertension is high blood pressure. High blood pressure is more than 140 over 90, meaning it's hypertension. If a patient have a blood pressure of 127 over 68, we still give the medication because if a patient was diagnosed with hypertension and their blood pressure in the range of 127 over 68, that means that the medication is keeping them in that range. So we still give the medication. When do we not give? We not give when the patient blood pressure is below 100, okay, over or below 80. So for example, 90 over 58, we hold the medication. Any systolic blood pressure less than 100, do not give blood pressure medication, okay? Hypertensive crisis are over 160, uh, over 100. Okay, so um, anything over 160 over 100 is crisis. We need to call the doctor because the patient could have a stroke because the pressure is so strong that it can cause um, the break broken of the uh, of the vessel in the brain. Okay, so prehypertension are from 120 to 138, 80 to 89. Stage one hypertension is 140 to 159 to 90 over 99. Hypertension stage two is anything above 160 over 100. Must go MD if the patient is stage two because they can have a stroke. Factors that influence hypertension, obviously fluid, the more fluid in the body, the higher the blood pressure will be. 
con the constriction of the blood vessel, uh, kidney issue, because whenever the kidney is failed, it will not create urine. And when it's not create urine, the body retain urine and increases the fluid retention and therefore increases blood pressure. Poor management of diabetes mellitus can lead to issues with damaging the blood vessel and causes uh, constriction and also increasing blood pressures as well, okay? Next, we have hypertension manifestation. So someone who have hypertension usually can have dizziness, fatigue, palpitation, dyspnea, headaches. Headaches are such a common sign for someone who have hypertension, okay? Hypertension crisis or anything more than 160 over 100, again, call the doctor. They are at risk for stroke. High blood pressure all the time or non-compliant with therapy can lead to kidney fail because so high, the blood pressure is so high that it's so hard for the blood in order to reach to the kidney. And if there's no perfusion to the kidney, the kidney will go into failure and it's just worsen the symptom. Complication related to organ damage, uh, overuse or, or too much damage to the circulatory system can lead to organ damage. All right, CAD. CAD is coronary artery disease. This is so commonly or mostly caused by fat in the artery. When there, whenever there's fat in the artery, it will accumulate and cause something called atherolo, atherolo, <laughs> something wrong with me tonight, guys. Um, atherosclerosis, okay? Uh, so those are like fat accumulation that causes obstruction of the blood vessel and cannot uh, and make the blood harder to flow through or, up, or even obstruct completely the blood vessel and cause an issue with ischemia or even stroke. So risk factor of coronary artery disease is smoking. You guys don't smoke. Smoking can cause constriction of the blood vessel and can lead to hypertension and all these sorts of um, artery diseases uh, because it's narrowed the blood vessel. So obesity, diabetes, secondary lifestyle, also BMI over 30, waist circumference over 40 for men and 35 for women, cholesterol over 200, triglyceride over 150, LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, over 160, HDL less than 40 for men and less than 50 for women. Nutritional therapy for someone who has CAD, eat the right type of fat. So we have to limit the saturated fat, which is the animal fat, including bacon, egg yolk, dairy fat, oils like coconut palm, butter, cheese, sour cream. Those are saturated fat and please limit it in, if you're having CAD problem. Use primary polyunsaturated fat like vegetable oil, fish oil, nut, seed, margarine. margarine. Uh, use also monosaturated fat like fish oil, avocados, nuts, and olives. So those are healthier type of fats. All right, next we have lipid lowering therapy. These can be used to break down the atherosclerosis in the body and um, it helps breaking down the fat in the body as well. So big things about fat is it can damage the liver. So when the patient on statin, we have to do the liver function test, evaluate liver function test about every six months. Statin is given in the afternoon about at one. All right, next we have heart failure. Heart failure is because of the muscle is weakened because the heart has been overworked. Now it is enlarged and it's not pumped as effectively anymore. So heart failure and heart attack are two different things. Heart attack is there's no oxygen or blood perfusing the heart, whereas heart failure is because the heart cannot pump or put out adequate cardiac output. So patient had loss of fluid volume overload that causes the heart to enlarge and be weakened or the heart get infection and the heart muscle got weak. Heart failure can cause excess fluid volume, the heart not pumping effectively to meet the body demands. And because it does not pump effectively, it causes blood stasis, which is pulling of the blood in the chamber and also backup of the fluid. So we have to report a weight gain of three pounds in two days or more, okay? three pounds or more in two days to the doctor. 
there are different types of heart failure. The first is systolic heart failure, which is the left side of the heart. So this is most commonly caused um, left ventricle unable to overcome the pressure to eject blood into the aorta. This can lead to dyspnea, difficult breathing, fluid in the lungs, because all the blood is back up into the lungs. So because of the heart failure. So that's why the lung gets so full of fluid and they, they can have blood tank sputum. The reason for this is because um, the alveoli is so full of the blood and the fluid that it burst when the patient cough and when the and then um it when the patient cough it can have blood tin spilled a minute because the alveoli is burst because of it's so full all right next moving to diastolic heart failure which is right-sided heart failure these are impaired ability of ventricle to relax and feel during diastole so because the right ventricle is failing, so it causes backed up into the, back, into the body, which is back up from the inferior and superior vena cava back into the rest of the body, right? So we will have peripheral edema compared to lungs and um, uh, lungs, fluid in the lung, like the left-sided heart failure. This patient also have a cyanosis and ascites. Ascites is fluid in the belly. Ascites can cause pain, obviously, difficulty breathing because the bigger the belly, the more obstruction it causes for the, the uh, diaphragm. So because the belly is full of fluid, the diaphragm cannot elongate it, cannot contract. So that's why it's hard to breathe for, for this patient. Then the, the doctor will have to do something called paracentesis, which is removing the fluid from the, uh, the belly, the stomach. All right, now is the peripheral vascular disease. Um, so this including arterial and venous. So please remember and know the difference between those two. So basically peripheral vascular disease is the narrowing of the arteries caused by atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, okay, I got it now. Lead to low oxygen perfusion, issue with perfusion to the feet, assessment, the number one assessment finding of PVD peripheral vascular disease is intermittent claudification. This is cough pain. It occurred due to the muscle ischemia during exercise walk caused by obstruction of the arterial flow. All right, so exercise causes the pain. The oxygen does not go into the calf muscle and it's gonna be you're going to be so painful when this patient walk. Okay, so intermittent claudification, aka calf pain, aka will be on exam, aka study. Parathesia, neuropathy can be filled by peripheral vascular disease as well. Core cool extremity with diminished pose, atrophy of the skin, loss of hair, shiny, thin, torn skin, rest, pain, especially elevated position. And so depends on the P the arterial or venous peripheral disease, then when we de depend on dango or lower, it, the patient can get red or pale, okay? All right, next we move on to care for patients who have peripheral vascular disease, uh, compression stocking, uh, sequential compression devices, uh, anticoagulants, elevated extremity, bed rest and elevation, warm, dilate blood pressure. So there are two types of PVD. PVD is peripheral vascular disease. There are two subset of PVD include perif peripheral arterial, arterial disease and peripheral venous disease. Okay, so PAD is peripheral arterial disease. This is all about the artery. You remember the artery bring blood to the tissues. So the problem with PAD is the blood is not being able to perfuse the feet. Compared to PVD, peripheral venous disease, the problem is the blood cannot come back to the heart. You see where I'm coming from? PAD, the blood cannot go down to the feet. PVD, the blood cannot go back up to the heart. 
All right. PAD, okay, now focus on PAD. PAD, peripheral arterial disease. Assessment include intermittent claudification, no edema, because the blood, there's no blood coming down to the feet. No blood, meaning no edema, no pooling. So because there's no blood coming to the feet, so there's no pulse, the pulse is diminished, no drainage. They will have round, smooth shores. They will have shiny, no leg hair, black esker. Shores often locates at the toes and the feet. They can have parathesia, neuropathy, core extremity with diminished pose, atrophy of the skin, loss of hair, shiny, thin, torn skin, rest pain, especially in elevated position, capillary refill, more than three seconds bilaterally. PVD assessment. All right, now focus on the venous. So dull, achy pain, lower leg edema, because the blood cannot go back, cannot go back to the heart because the vein there is having issue, venous, venous disease. So that's why the blood is pulling there and stay there and causes swelling and edema. The pulse is present because there is blood. So there's pulse, there will be drainage. The shore will be irregular borders. They'll have yellow slab or ruddy skin. The shores located in the ankles. Now let's move on to neuro chapters. So in neuro chapters, cataract. Cataract is basically the lens is cloudy. There's a films in the lens and causes the decrease in acuity. Nursing care for patients with cataract surgery, pre-op, we have to give them dilating drops, dilate eye to increase surgical field, assess for risk factors, bleeding, lab medication that they on, post-op, protect the eye using eye shield and put on for about one day. Make sure that the patient has a drive home, someone drive them home, teach no driving for a short period of time and teach them to wear sunglasses because the eyes were dilated, pre-operated, remember? So the pupil does not constrict it very well. Also, therefore they need the sunglasses to protect their eyes. Uh, they have to decrease intraocular pressure, meaning the pressure in the eyes by using medication, teach the patient not to bend over or tie the shoelace because those can increase eye, uh, intraocular pressure, IOP, not straining, meaning when they go to poop, do not teach them, do not strain because it can increase IOP. So they might, we might give them stool softener. Complication, we need to teach the patient about signs, symptoms of infection, uh, including pain, redness, odor, fever, drainage color. Also, persistent pain after the post-op procedure, after the surgery, is, not a, is abnormal. It's not a common thing. If they have persistent pain, that the pain is persistent and stay there, we need to call a doctor, okay? Pain is an early sign of intraocular pressure. If the patient complains of pain after the procedure, there's an issue. Report to the doctor. Glaucoma. So glaucoma, there is basically a hole in our eye that drains the aqueous humor, which is the fluid in the eye. However, in glaucoma, the hole is basic, the hole is closed up. The fluid continues to produce. Therefore, it causes clogged up and increases pressure to the eyes. Too much pressure will lead to low perfusion, over time, no perfusion, and then the patient end up with loose vision. So basically, the outflow of the aqueous humor is blocked, therefore lead to increased intraocular pressure. Because the pressure is so high, the blood cannot perfuse the eye, ultimately lead to no vision and blindness. Manifestation of glaucoma, early sign is increased intraocular pressure, which can cause significant pain, decreased ability to focus, poor vision, hurt at uh, headache, tunnel vision, and also how uh, we can evaluate these patient uh, glaucoma symptom by asking questions like, are you having changes in your visual field? This patient can have changes in the visual field because the tunnel vision, remember? Later side of glaucoma include ocular pain, typically painless, 
but feel abnormal. Blur vision with halos around light, redness, dilate, non-reactive, nausea and vomiting, vision loss and headache. So these are like late side. All right, now we move on to mini ears disease, mini ears disease. So this basically the production, too much production or not enough reabsorption of the fluid inside the ear. The fluid also moves back and forth. So these patients usually have a lot of vertical and dizziness and they also have hearing loss. So assessment is basically vertical dizziness, whirling. Whenever I hear about no things, see about mini ear disease, immediately associated with vertical dizziness and whirling. Okay, progressive sensory neural hearing loss. This is middle middle ear sign. I don't know what it is. Please, I don't need to, you guys don't need to know that. No tinnitus. Tinnitus is a late sign of mini ears. Pressure or fullness in the ears, nausea and vomiting is late sign. Treatment, ear drop to dry out the ear so that the fluid doesn't build up. There's no cure for mini ear disease. We have to teach them to adjust the diet, lower the intake of sodium. So by this point, I hope you guys already know that eating sodium can retain fluid in the body. So with a disease such as mini ears where fluid is not reabsorbed and there's too much fluid in the ear, we have to teach them to stop eating too much salt. So lifestyle changes, okay? So now seizure and epilepsy. So basically about seizures or anything related to seizing seizures, um, know that we have to remove harmful object. The bed it needed to be in the lowest position, turn the patient on their side so that if the patient vomit, they don't aspirate on themselves and they can, the, the thing can get out instead of getting into the trachea to prevent aspiration. Patient need to be on seizure medication and they cannot or should not never, should never abruptly stop the medication. Sometimes the doctor will slowly take the patient off the drug to evaluate if the patient have the seizure or not, but they have to taper it off. Do not ever abruptly stop. And that's the tips too, guys. In all of the exam question, if there's anything, um, the, the client suddenly stop taking the med, that's the wrong answer. Or that's the answer that needs to be intervened immediately or reevaluate immediately because we should not just cut off any medication abruptly. Bed always in lowest position for this patient, okay? One of the uh, main medication that usually be given uh, that given for seizure patient or active seizure patient are uh, lorazepam, which is an Ativan. All right, now we have multiple sclerosis. These are MS. So the patho is the damage of the myelin sheath, a known trigger that stimulates the immune system to attack the myelin sheath or the nerve. This is an autoimmune. What is, when you guys hear the word autoimmune, please associate it with the body attack itself, increase in protein in the body because the body uses the, I mean, yeah, decrease in protein, not increase, decrease in protein because the body uses the protein to create antibodies. Antibodies are protein because the body uses protein to create antibody to attack itself. So not only we lose this protein, but we also being attacked by our, by our body. So that's why it's called autoimmune. So please remember those two and associate those two when you guys hear the word autoimmune, okay? Assessment finding include muscle spasm, weakness, paralysis, parathesis, dysphagia, double vision, diplopia. Remember this. I reduce this, this the, the, the important assessment finding to this already. There's no cure for MS. The diet for MS is high protein, why? Because the body uses all of the protein to create antibody to attack the body. So that's why we have to supplement the body with protein so that we're not out of protein. B12 will help with anemia. Next, move on to Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is problem with dopamine and production of dopamine. So basically, there's not or not enough dopamine in the brain or the body that 
usually one of the mnemonic to remember is not enough dove dog in the park. Um, key assessment finding is slow initiation of the movement, bradykinesia, tremors, shaking hands, short shuffling steps, stoop poster, mask-like facial expression, rigidity, and poor swallowing. So most common medication that we give to Parkinson's disease is levodopa sininet. This help with the patient help with the lack of dopamine that the patient has. So low. So the most important thing that to know about this medication is they have to follow a low protein diet because high protein will interfere with levodopa um, and does not allow the med to be absorbed in the body. Okay. So. Remember, with MS, we have to give the patient a high protein diet. With Parkinson's disease, we have to lower the protein in the diet. Okay, so completely different. So please know that. Now move on to MG, myethesia gravis. So this is again autoimmune. Autoimmune, the body attack itself decreases protein in the body. So what do we have to do? Increase the protein in diet, okay? So in this case, instead of attacking the, the myelin sheath like the MS, MG, the body attacked the acetylcholine. So the problem is weakness, progressive weakness. Biggest assessment is weakness. So muscle weakness will get worse with activity, can cause diplopia, dysphagia, impaired respiration, droopy eyelids, eyelids, incontinence. Biggest complication for these MG patients is swallowing and breathing. Now move on to ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig disease. Know both of the names, please. Often happen in young, active, healthy people. So no cure, fast progressive disease, progressive paralysis, meaning that the, paraly the paralyzation moving from the feet, moving um, progressively, okay? Eventually will cause respiratory paralysis. So in this case, please know that the mental status does not change. They still there. It's just the motor function, the muscle are not working. No muscle are working, but the brain still working. So ALS people will lose motor function from feet ascend up to the lungs. They won't be able to walk, poop, pee, then finally breathe. So in order for them to live, they have to rely on a machine to keep them alive. Priority meaning uh, are maintaining the airway, suction PRN, intubate the patient, monitor for pneumonia and respiratory failure. Next, we have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is forgetfulness disease, right? So irreversible cell degeneration, progressive forgetfulness, how to help family to cope with this. Routine is the key thing in Alzheimer's disease. Keep the same routine will help remembering, decrease anxiety in Alzheimer's patient. This patient get very anxious when taken out of their routine and not able to sleep. Also, every task, should, the step should be broken down one step at the time and also talk leveling eye with the patient and talk in normal tone, okay? Family picture will help routine of when we get them to the bathroom to prevent incontinence. So everything about routine and the steps will be broken down one at a time. Keep routine so that the patient don't feel like they are losing their control. Now is the GPS ground to brain paralysis. So neurological demyelination of motor neurons which control muscle movement. So GBS and ALS, which is the Lurinier disease. So these are kind of similar, right? They both progressive paralysis of the motor of the muscle. However, the difference between the GBS and the ALS is the ALS, there's no cure. The GBS, there's a cure and it is reversible. So basically GBS, is the progressive weakening from the feet to the brain. The GPS will have weakness in the lower extremity, then disease move up to the bladder area, causes incontinence, they move to the colon, constipation and get to the lung. The patient can't move the lung anymore, no breathing and they need a ventilator. So, however, GPS is reversible. It comes and goes away. 
it start paralysis from the ground to the brain, but when it goes away, it goes away from the brain down. Must put them on ventilator when reaches the bladder because after bladder, it will cause a respiratory failure. Virus is often the cause of this to happen. All right, now move on to stroke. So what is stroke? Stroke is blood flow to the brain stopped somehow. Can be bleeding, can be um, ischemic, can be blockage from atherosclerosis. Bleeding into brain tissue can also cause stroke. Ischemic, there are two types of stroke, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke usually causes by a thrombotic event, which is the blood clot in the cerebral artery or the blood clot that formed there, called thrombotic. Em embolic event is the blood clot from another part of the body like DVT from the leg that travels to the cerebral artery and causes a blockage causes blockage so that the blood cannot go to the brain to perfuse the brain and lead to stroke. Something that makes the perfusion of the blood clot causes the pathway of the perfusion to stop. That is ischemic stroke. Effect of ischemic stroke. So how do I remember it? Left language, right reckless. So if we have a right-sided stroke failure, okay, which is the brain on the right side, we will have sign and symptom on the left side. So right brain stroke can have, can the, the, they can have left hemoplegia, sp spatial perceptual deficit, deny or minimizing problem, short attention span, impaired judgment, impulsive with safety, reckless, impaired time concept, whereas left brain, they will have right hemiplegia, impaired speech or language aphasia, expressive aphasia, difficulty speaking and understanding language, impaired ability to determine right from left, depressed, anxious, slow and cautious, unable to perform math. Okay, again, left language, right reckless. How do we know if a patient have a stroke? So we do something called FAST notice, okay, it's, I think it will be on the exam. Um, facial, drooping, not symmetrical, maybe one side is not working, like they'll have like smirk like this. Arms, weakness on one side, unable to raise the arm even. If the raised arm, if raised arm even, there's no stroke. Like we ask the patient, can you raise arm and it's raised arm even and no stroke. But if they, they raise one arm and the other arm is like this, then we might we have to move on to the next step of fast and um, they are high risk for stroke, okay? So unable to grasp my hand or and venous of both sides, this goes for the feet as well, can be indication of stroke. Speech, it can be slurred, incomprehensible, mumbling, what is your name? Then they answer ice cream cone. They can have aphasia, expressive aphasia, and we have to note the time when these happening and call a stroke alert. How do we diagnose a stroke? Firstly, we initially, we do a CT scan. If a patient have a sign symptom of stroke, when this happens, time is key. We want them to be treated as soon as possible. Remember, there's only the window of three hours that we can give the TPA to treat ischemic stroke. So that's why time is key. Diagnostic done as soon as possible because CT scans show which type of stroke they are having. It determines the treatment for the patient hemorrhagic or ischemic, no CT scan, no treatment. Sometimes CT scan doesn't show that the patient having a stroke, but we're concerned that they still might having a stroke. We do MRI for more definitive, um, but we don't do it at first because MRI is expensive. Then we do Doppler or carotids. This would tell if there's clots in there. Tell if we have perfusion to the carotid as well. Acute phase of stroke without CT scan, no treatment. Don't know what kind it is. So give drug, TPA, heparin, coumadin, plavic, aspirin, ticlic. These are all anticoagulant, which is thin the blood. So these drug cannot be given to a hemorrhagic patient because it could kill them. So TPA, this is very important to remember, okay? If the patient have an ischemic stroke, we will evaluate to give TPA. TPA is an anticoagulant 
specifically, it is a thrombolytic, which is, what does it mean? It's, it's lice, it break down the clot. So um, MUD made assessment before we administered any stroke. So inclusion criteria include ischemic stroke onset within three hours. If it is outside of three hours, they're not qualified to get this medication anymore. CT scan confirmed that this is an ischemic stroke measurable deficit, deficit on IH stroke scale examination. They are over 18. If they met all of these, give the drug. Exclusion criteria include, if the patient's symptoms are minor, rapidly improved, will not work. Patient has seizure at onset of stroke. Patient's systolic blood pressure is higher than 185, which can increase risk for hemorrhagic bleed. Patient diastolic blood pressure higher than 110 then we do not give this med as well. Labs, if patient received heparin within the last 48 hours and has elevated PTT, the blood too thin to take this drug, so we do not give it as well. PT time is more than 15 seconds, platelet less than 100,000, glucose less than 50 or more than 400. Patient has another stroke within the last three months, major surgery within 14 days. Do not give the drug. All right, now we have hemorrhagic stroke. So hemorrhagic stroke sign symptoms are a uh, bad headache. They can have nausea and vomiting as well. If patient has an aneurysm, a big pouch of weakening uh, in patient vessel in carotid or in the brain, we can surgically clip those, take the clot out, put the coil to strengthen the areas, keep the structure strong. But um, if it's bleeding already, um, it's just some with hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke, uh, it just wait and see the type of thing. Hopefully it will stop bleeding and then this patient will go back to rehab. Diagnostic study. Okay, so um, that's it for the neuro chapter. Now we move on to the GI chapter, okay? If I'm going too fast, just slow me down and then pause to write things down, okay? Uh, diagnostic study help to know if patient is getting new, good nutrition. So. Uh, in order to tell if someone who are nutritional um, adequate, we check the albumin and total protein. Uh, total protein is more specific, but rarely seen because it's very expensive to do. Uh, but when the patient has nutritional imbalance, when they are malnourished, then we pull this test to see exactly where they are. All right, let's move on to upper GI series. So I have to know this, okay? No endoscopy, no lower... Um, no different, no, the, the, the GI series, those are important. So endoscopy, why do we do endoscopy? We do endoscopy to visualize and to see what the tissue is like in the bowel, okay? Upper, it's anything from the bowel and above. If the patient having stomach pain, we do endoscopy to visualize any ulcers or bleeding that's going on in that stomach, which can cause the pain. Or sometimes patient can have an um, intestinal uh, or a stomach obstruction or something like that. Then we can use endoscopy to visualize, basically to see what's going on in the stomach. Uh, so the patient continues to vomit, aspiration, difficulty swallow, so much pain after eating food. And this can be a sphincter issues. It may not close completely and allow acid to come up to the esophagus. If there's an acid issue, the sphincter, okay, so the endoscopy will help visualizing how back up it is, how bad the lining is being erosed or breaking down. Uh, the most important thing about endoscopy is how to prepare the patient for it. So we have to make sure that the patient has been NPO at least for eight hours, teach them what are going to happen, teach them that you won't get to eat afterward because lidocaine is sprayed into the back of the throat to numb the back of the throat. The gag reflects so that they can have the scope into the esophagus, meaning that uh, bef when, during the surgery of the endoscopy, the lidocaine is sprayed into the back of the throat and they have the, visual the visualization scope go straight into the oral cavity, into the esophagus and into the stomach um, so that they can visualize. So we have to teach the patient what's going to happen and explain that. And then also different medication that can make the patient drowsy because the procedure is a little invasive. 
So after the procedure, there's no need for swallow test before they can eat again, but we have to check if they have their gag reflex back. If they have their gag reflex back, then they can eat and, or, and meaning that the patient can have, a, can swallow their saliva. Okay, so stay still during the procedure. This is important to teach the patient too. They have to stay still during the procedure because they don't, we don't want the scope to damage any uh, stomach lining or the internal um, area of the patient. Also complication for endoscopy can cause an aspiration. That's why we cannot have food until gag reflex come back. Now, which is the lower GI series, these are a little bit easier to remember, colonoscopy. So it's basically the visualization of the colon. It's the same scope, go through the esophagus. So they have the same complication aspiration, but instead of stopping at the stomach, they go deeper into the intestine, okay? So the most important thing about colonoscopy, how to prepare for it. So go lightly is a fluid that usually prescribed for patients who are going to go over colonoscopy. So it is a very potent laxative that is used to clean and clear the bowel prior to undergoing an endoscopy, uh, colonoscopy. It makes the bowel go provide and provide electrolyte. That's why it's called go lightly. Uh, it is thick and liquid prescribed as one gallon they have to start drink the night before, about six o'clock the night before, and drink as much as they can or tolerate it. It has to be effective, meaning that clear liquid coming out, no stool or chunks. If it's not effective, we have to do enemas until clear. Side effects include hypotension, dehydration. After drink, the patient should expect to have many bowel movement, water stool, must make sure that the patient come to do the colonoscopy to stop the coming out of the rectum must be clear. So when they do a colonoscopy, everything come out of the rectum must be clear before they do this procedure. If they're still junk or the stool still have the, the stool colors, they are not qualified to do the test. And if you guys are nurse and you see the patient still have junk or the color is still not clear, what do we do? We have to do enemas for this patient until the color come out clear. Need to be clear because in order to visualize the bowel, there have to be nothing inside and have to be clean and clear. So we have to ask the patient, did you prep? Is it clear when you go to the bathroom? If not, we must do enemas until the fluid is clear. Complications include dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, GI system can cause excessive diarrhea, excessive vomiting, always look at potassium and sodium, okay? So if someone who have excessive diarrhea, what kind of acidosis or alkalosis that they may have, guys? Okay, pause this. All right, and then answer and then come back. So if someone who have excessive diarrhea, they will have they will have metabolic acidosis, right? If someone who have excessive diarrhea, they will have metabolic acidosis. The reason for that is because when we have excessive diarrhea, we lose a lot of bicarbonate, which is the HCO3, which can lead to um, ex, uh, lower the buffer and causes acidic in the blood. So excessive diarrhea lead to excessive, will lead to metabolic alcohol, uh, metabolic acidosis, whereas excessive vomiting, okay, answer guys, excessive vomiting can lead to metabolic alkalosis. The reason is because when we vomit, they vomit all of the acid in the stomach, which can lead to lowered acid content in the body and lead to metabolic alkalosis compared to medical metabolic acidosis and diarrhea. Okay. I'm um, sorry. I was just go off topic, but yeah. Also look at potassium and sodium level as well, because when we diarrhea a lot, we vomit a lot. When we vomit, we lose sodium. When we diarrhea, we lose potassium. GERD, okay, so GERD basically acid go up to the esophagus because of this poor sphincter control, which is the sphincter control or allow the acid from the stomach to come up. 
the problem with the sphincter, weak sphincter, that's happened, what's happened in GERD. The patient will feel heartburn, chest pain. Sometimes the burn, the heartburn pain can radiate to the jaw or chest, may feel tight, makes the patient feel like they're having a heart attack. Chest pain, jaws hurting, chest from the reflux back up, esophagus. Risk factor include age, sphincter issues, spicy food, caffeine, chocolate, carbonated drink, acidic food, tomatoes, and stress. Teach patients to modify modifiable risk factors. These include avoid spicy food, fat food, carbonated drink, acidic food, change the diet, sit up after eating, eat slower, small meal. So yeah, avoid lifting and straining. Uh, this can weaken the sphincter. Uh, never have milk at night before bed because as it can boil the milk inside the stomach and curdle it, patient wake up and will have horrible nausea and vomiting. So these patients need to be avoid chocolate, elevated head of bed 30 degree, not lying down for two to three hours after the meal, bed block, put pillow to lay up at night to lay eight for digestion. Next, we have gastritis. Gastritis is basically the acid is wearing down the mucosa in the stomach and causes the red spot, and which is indicating that the lining was broken down. So if someone will have a red spot, that means that the patient is at the tipping point of bursting and causing GI bleed. Um, so if they go to stage three, they can cause bleeding and die quickly. The goal is to avoid the red from bleeding or going to peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease is the acid keep wearing down the mucosa and turn into state three ulcer in the stomach, ultimately lead to perforated bowel GI bleed. Etiology is infection like H. pylori could contribute to PUD, lifestyle like too much stress or acidic or wrong food can cause this PUD as well. Certain medication can also cause this PUD. Assessment finding includes same assessment finding as gastritis, GERD, with the exception of the dysphagia. Clinical manifestation for e PUD include, sometimes they can be asymptomatic at first, but then there's a bleed, and then they'll have epigastric pain, black back pain, dull, aching, burning pain, depends on the when the meal was digested as well. Heard burn, nausea and vomiting, melanin, black pterostore, coffee ground emesis, meaning that some kind of GI bleed in the upper belly that coagulate and when the patient cough, they have coffee ground emesis. Seasonal drains, allergies, that's why we give histamine to receptor to some patients to help them with the allergy that causes with the acid production. There are two different types of PUD depend on the location, make it easier to be either gastric make it either gastric or duodenal ulcers. So this is when the PU uh, peptic ulcer keep erodes and lead to ulcers. So with gastric ulcers, gastric is stomach, duodenal ulcer is the small intestine. So gastric ulcer is because the stomach come first, so and up higher in the GI tract. So the pain with eating happens sooner. The pain is 30 to one hour after the meal. Food will make the pain worse. Food irritate the stomach. This will make the patient eat less, weight loss, burning, nausea, and vomiting. Duodenal ulcer, um, because the, the small intestine comes second, it's at the end of the stomach. So the pain is two to three hours after the food. Food can relieve, make heart burn, dull pain, feel better. This will make the patient want to eat more so that they can feel good, gain weight, burning, nausea, and vomiting. Intervention for PUD patient. Patient has acid reflux issue that can cause them to have an ulcer that bleeds. Need to be, be putting this patient on MPO. If they have a GI bleed, we put them on MPO. When the patient don't eat, they don't produce acid. And if there's no acid, there's no erosion of the mucosa. Put the patient on NG tube suction because we don't want those blood to sit, sit in there. We have to suction them to take up the acid and allow the stomach to rest and heal. Uh, we put the patient on IV fluid to hydrate the patient and stop smoking. Biggest complication from PUD include hemorrhagic, most common bleeding, coffee ground emesis, black terry stool. That was when the ulcer has worn away so much that it causes bleeding. 
perforation. This is the most lethal complications, leaking stomach into the peritoneum, poop into the peritoneum, okay? Because when it's perforated, there's a big hole, so everything inside the stomach or the intestine can go through the hole, including poop and food, and can cause a sepsis, uh, okay? And eventually death. Both are considered emergency situation. Perforation will lead to an emergency surgery because risk of septicemia. Signs symptom of perforation. So signs symptom include persistent pain, no bowel movement because it goes to the wrong spot, fever, late sight, gut already infected, rotten, which lead to infection and sepsis. Sudden traumatic onset pain spread all over the abdomen. You have tachycardia, weak pose, because perfusion does not go to the gut. They'll have rigid, board-like abdomen muscle because of the feces and gas, all of those things. They'll have no bowel sound, mobility is absent, nausea, vomiting because the stool is backing up and lead to vomit. All right. All right, now we have to inflammatory bowel disease. So there's two types of inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It means that the gut is inflamed ir and irritated. There's don't know why. Because of this irritation, the gut does go to hyperdrive. So these patients who have inflammatory disease, they can go to have diarrhea like a lot of times a day, like 20 times a day. This is the natural response from the GI tract because when it is inflamed, um, the GI tract, want just make sure they want to poop so that everything can get gets out and they speed up the gi tract so they have many bowel movement a day the body trying to speed up and expel the content you know to, to get rid of the irritation biggest complication is dehydration because they excessively diarrhea have the excessive diarrhea fluid volume deficit and electrolyte imbalances for this patient do not give them food to fix their nutritional deficit because the stomach does not work. No use of enteral tube like NG tube or J tube because NG tube is basically go through the oral cavity and goes to the stomach, but we don't, the stomach does not work. So we have to give them TPN, which go through the vein so that nutrition can nourish the body through the vein. Um, we use TPN or PPN, okay? Uh, so there are two different ulcerative and Crohn disease. So ulcerative is happen at the top of the descending colon, where's the descending colon? This is in the large intestine. So ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid rectum. Yeah. Okay, so descending is this one. Um, main problem are bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Different between UC and Crohn disease are tenemus and rectal bleeding. These two are specific to UC. Tenemus are, is the feeling that you need to pass stool even though your bowel are already empty. It may involve straining, pain, and cramping. Sensation of incomplete bowel evacuation and deficiency in fluid volume. Next is Crohn disease. Crohn disease happens sporadically throughout the whole large intestine compared to just the descending like the ulcerative colitis. Common is diarrhea, abdominal cramping are common, rectal bleeding, sometimes occur with Crohn disease, although not as often as with UC. So etiologies, both are autoimmune disease. The body attack itself can also be an infected process, agent can cause this, and says allergies. Assessment include, biggest assessment are diarrhea, dehydration due to diarrhea, the patient could die, bloody stool, uh, loose volume, hypovolemic anemia, weight loss, the patient don't want to eat, no nutrition to absorb due to diarrhea. They can have fever due to gut is bleeding, skin is open, they have an open entry for bacteria, causes high fever because the body is re uh, fighting those bacteria and causes an inflammatory process. They can have fatigue, they can have anemia, blood loss, malnutrition, not absorbing anything, folic acid, anemia, and iron. Patient can have up to 20 times a day diarrhea, bloody diarrhea. This will help to an, uh, lead to anemia, tachycardia, 
low PP hypovolemic shock, abdominal pain, fever, and dehydration. How to fix this? Uh, fluid, stop the inflammatory response. Antidiarrhea will not fix this. We use steroids on and off, not all the time because steroid is bad, bad. Steroid can cause issue with the bone, uh, causes it to be spongy, can cause issue with the blood sugar, can cause it to be elevated, can suppress the inflammatory process and also can suppress the uh, immune system. So those are bad, bad. So on and off, not all the time can use immune suppression from the biologic therapy as well. Now we move on to diverticular disease. So diverticular is a completely opposite disease with inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease is excessive diarrhea, whereas diverticular is constipation problem. So it's, it's a, it do not cause diarrhea, it causes constipation because the patient is so constipated and they cause they straining so th there will be out pouches of the colon and these pouches got full of poop and this can cause infection peritonitis and wears away rot perforation this will happen if we don't teach the patient to control the constipation Crohn's and ulcerative are inflammatory bowel disease, equal diarrhea. Diverticulosis and diverticulitis are the opposite, a constipation problems. The goal, nurse do everything to keep them from constipated. These patients get so constipated that they strain and push to poop, causes the lining of the bowel in the rectum area to poof, causes pockets and all over the place. This could lead to infection because these pouches can get rotten and lead to perforation. Imagine the poop staying there for a long time. It can cause this perforation and, and issue with infection. So we must keep them from away from constipation, keep, give them more fibers, give them more water, do not give them seed because those cannot be, sometimes not be digested and can cause um, laceration in the stomach lining. I mean, the intestine lining. Uh, good motility equal no stuck. Prevent constipation, get the patient poop, give them water, fiber, prevent infection, peritonitis, and perforation. All right, parenteral, parenteral nutrition. Uh, we give this for inflammatory bowel disease patient, okay, because the bowel is not working. This is the last effort when everything have tried. This is given through the bloodstream. If the patient must have a strential light, uh, go through the big vascular system. We prefer to go through the big vascular system because this is very irritated to the vein. So we give them through a central light, like a subclavian vein or something that um, centrally. TPN has a lot of electrolyte, insulin, fat, and a lot of sugar. So they're really high in sugar. So for non-diabetic patient, we must all check the finger stick, even though they're not diabetic, but they're on these medications. So we still check it because the sugar content in this TPN is so high. We check it every six hours. We get insulin when the sugar is high, so much sugar, normal person can process it. On a mild sliding scale, example 155, get two to three unit. For diabetic patient, instead of six hours, we check them for every four hours and also before bed, uh, before meal and at bedtime, so ACHS, finger stick. Uh, gets insulin when the sugar is high and instead of on the mild, mild sliding scale, they're on an aggressively solid sliding scale where if they get 155, then they get five units of insulin, for example. So the biggest complication of this medication of this uh, is hyperglycemia. If we pull off the, and also hypoglycemia as well. So if we pull off this drug too fast and we take it off too abruptly, it can lead to hypoglycemia because the body is used to receiving such high amount of glucose so that the pancreas consistently secreting insulin. But if we stop abruptly, the pancreas is not um, able to respond to that as quickly. So it's still releasing a lot of insulin and therefore it leads to hypoglycemia. So in order to avoid sign symptom of hypoglycemia, we slowly slow down the rate of the TBN and take them off, drop down to half the rate and then half the rate 30 minutes later. All the time we look for sign symptom of hypoglycemia, cold and clammy. And also look for sign symptom of hypoglycemia too, which is um, Hot and dry.
All right, guys, so we did it. Um, but before we end, uh, okay, I just wanted to uh, say that um, I will be posting, I will have the uh, little, um, what is it called, Kahoot linked, link under the description box too, okay? So please do them uh, on your free time so that you guys can practice, okay? Thank you so much for today and good luck tomorrow. Just you guys got it and um, take it slow, do it slowly and um, breathe every 15 questions. Just stand up and stretch and breathe and trust the process. Know that you guys got this. Thank you. Bye.